All right. So um, we've been talking uh, in the last little while about fluid uh, dynamics um, and trying to understand behavior related to moving fluids rather than static fluids. And this is one of the examples that we've messed around with in the past. I think it's quite useful. It's kind of an interesting machine. It's what you get for $150,000, I believe. Um, and so questions you could imagine asking for this would be, um, what kind of velocity do you have to kick water out of there to be able to lift a human? Um, what kind of power do you need in the pump? There's a pump that's pulled behind it on a, uh, a raft and an umbilical. Uh, you can't see it, but I guess you can actually there. You could just see it on the right-hand side of the screen there. And so the question would be, what kind of power would you want in that raft, uh, in the pump that would uh, run this thing? So interesting, interesting toy. So let's look a little bit at what we might need to do to uh, understand that. And so you remember that the basis of our calculations were on our friend... Daniel Bernoulli and his famous equation. Um, along a streamline, uh, it's defined as this, and this is kind of the, the way that you typically all remember it. I always write it in terms of pressure head, velocity head, and elevation head. They're all lengths. They have to be equivalent to each other. You know, when we're talking about homogeneity and consistency in units in equations uh, five weeks ago, I guess that's what was the, the word of the day, but of course we take that for granted now that we, we, we make sure that our equations all have the same units. Um, sometimes we write it in a slightly different way. We don't need to know this right now, but we can also include things. Bernoulli's equation, as we remember, was for inviscid fluids, so there's no loss of energy in a system. So in the example of pulling something across the table towards me, to be able to get it back to its initial position, I have to expend energy pulling it towards me, and pushing it backwards. So we're using up frictional losses in that system. And so systems where we have viscosity and we do work against viscosity are not are viscous, are, are not inviscid, uh, and therefore, strictly speaking, we can't use uh, Bernoulli's equation. But if we account for these losses, both as major losses and minor losses, minor, minor losses, they're both due to friction in pipes and in fluids going around bends and changing direction, we'll see that we can actually use uh, Bernoulli's equation for systems that do have viscous losses within them. And when we do that, we'll write in the losses here. We don't need to do it now for a few weeks. And we can also put energy into the system by putting a pump head into the system to be able to physically push fluid through the system. If we do that, it's useful always to be able to write it from upstream to downstream. And in that case, it's useful to always write it from upstream location one to downstream location two. And so it has to be done that way if we're dealing with uh, losses just out of the convention. But we don't have to worry about that now. Um, we also talked last time about the idea that we could look at fluids traveling across a system both along a streamline which we may call S, and both normal to a streamline, and we could write uh, equations for those. And if that's the case, then we have a slightly different expression here, which you'll see um, is just not written. It's written in terms of pressures. All of these have to be units of pressures. But you can see it's the same expressions, except uh, actually it's useful to, to do this. Remember we did this example of fluid going around a bend, and we had this idea of a radius that it's going around. It has a streamlined velocity. This is always a streamlined velocity, right? The velocity normal to this streamline has to be zero because it's orthogonal by definition. Uh, but you'll remember that our sign convention was one where we have z is positive upwards and uh, N is positively inwards towards the center of rotation. And so I think the interesting thing about looking at this is we could write this as P plus, if we write this out as rho G, 
we could write this as p plus rho g plus, I'm going to take this term here, this, what is n in this case? n is pointing upwards, z is pointing upwards, so this just becomes, if we take the, don't worry about the integral, v squared over r, and we replace this by dz. In this particular case, dz will be positive dz, right? Because it's equal to that. And I only say this because it's useful to be able to think of this, because this now is basically saying that you're taking gravity and you're getting the pressure at a point, but now it's not just gravity you feel as you go down through the system. You actually feel uh, an extra weight on top of yourself. And so it, it basically, when you go around a curve like this, it enhances gravity by this amount, positive. And if you go around a curve which is the opposite way, where the radius is this way, and n dn is equal to, whoops, you may or may not appreciate this, is equal to minus dz, right? Because of these being in the opposite direction, then this is a negative. And so it's a useful way to think of it. So going around this bend as you go into it, it pushes you in your seat as you go up the ramp, and you're feeding extra gravity, extra g's, it's because of this term here. You go over the top of the, the, the crest of the bump, you feel yourself as if you have less weight, and it's just reducing this. It's exactly the same kind of ideas as in an accelerating fluid, as you accelerate linearly. If you accelerate upwards in an elevator, the pressure distribution you have, instead of being linear and equal to the unit weight of the fluid, it's increased over that. And so it's exactly the same, same idea. So you can think about this increasing uh, gravity. Right? So that's where we are. So we can get Bernoulli's equation both along a streamline and also for the pressures as we go normal to a streamline, and we know how to do that. Um, and so why don't we talk about now using Bernoulli equation in a couple of different ways. One, to get the equation for a free jet, which we'll maybe do later, and also continuity. Continuity is that we've said that if we have... If we write this, whoops, if we write Bernoulli upstream and downstream, we have a total of six terms. We need to know five of them to be able to solve it, but sometimes we only have four. So what we can do sometimes is we can use continuity to write the upstream and downstream velocities in terms of each other, just by the areas of flow, to be able to actually solve the problem. Okay? All right, so enough of the, the recap. What will we talk about? Uh, well, we'll talk about pressure measurement, I guess. So, it's interesting that when we, um, when you fly, uh, that you think that all of this tremendous uh, technology you have, uh, things like GPS to be able to locate yourself. Of course, the Malaysian flight, was it 37, that disappeared when the, the pilot decided to fly it somewhere, apparently into the western Indian Ocean. And... Uh, part of the flight surfaces turned up in Reunion Island uh, uh, not so long ago. But despite all of this technology, the method by which you measure air speeds within a plane still is by pitot tube. And I mention that here because one of the problems apparently with Air France Flight uh, 447, which is flying between Rio and Paris, uh, it never reached its destination. Uh, was because it went through a thunderstorm. Thunderstorms that are very cold uh, in the, the crest of them. And I don't know if they'll have a picture of it here. Uh, perhaps they don't. But the pitot tubes, which are the method by which you... I guess we don't have it there. The, the method by which we... <coughs> we have pitot tubes. Very simple, uh, we'll sh we'll show one on here. Oh, there you are. So these little things coming out of uh, the side of the plane, um, they're just small tubes. If you get onto the local planes here in State College, as you walk up the aisle, you can physically see it sitting right there to your left underneath the, uh, the pilot's window. It's a little uh, tube that points forwards, and it uses... Bernoulli's principle to be able to measure pressures uh, in the system. And so how does that physically 
work. It works like this. So the idea is that you have a tube. This tube points forwards. Uh, you can imagine the tube as being static and having the wind move past it rather than being something that's moving in a static fluid. And so it's easier to think of it as a static tube that has the wind moving past it. And it has two tubes, two concentric tubes. One tube which is red here, which has fluid impinging on it here at point two, and also measuring the pressure at this location here. And also a, a second tube, an annulus outside this, which measures a pressure at point four as a result of fluid going across this surface here. And so the important thing is that the fluid that hits point two stagnates. It goes to zero velocity from some bigger velocity away from it. And the fluid that goes across here never stagnates because it goes across the top of it. So what we could do is we could write the pressure at point three in terms of Bernoulli's equation. We're going to assume that basically Z1 is equal to Z2 is equal to Z3 is equal to Z4. Tubes are typically, instead of being this way, they're typically horizontal, so it actually is true, since this is in the horizontal plane. This is looking in plan view, if you like, uh, at this. And so if you look at the behavior between locations 2 and 3, then we can write that at point 2, point, sorry, at point 3, This is zero. The elevations are the same. And so we can write, if we measure the pressure at point three, uh, then we can get the magnitude of it as a function of the, the flow velocity. In the static tube, we know that points pressure at one and four are the same because there's no killing of velocity here. So you're just measuring the pressure in the atmosphere, atmospheric pressure in this particular case. So if we substitute the magnitude of this atmospheric pressure here, and then we measure the magnitude of this pressure, then this pressure is a direct indicator of the speed we're going at. And so the problem with uh, flight 447 was apparently going through this uh, thundercloud is it iced up. And if you get ice across the tip of this tube, so it doesn't work anymore, it doesn't work. It doesn't tell you what your velocity is, and apparently the pilots panicked and did some strange things that made the plane stall, and it basically flew into, uh, flew into the ocean. But it's amazing that something as complicated and as worth as many million dollars as a, as a plane is, is really controlled by something so uh, relatively straightforward. And so the solution to this, by the way, is to have heated pitot tubes. So they have heaters in them so they don't freeze up. And so, so if you rearrange this equation in terms of measuring the difference between pressures that you measure at point 3 and point 4, then you have as a function of this differential in pressure, the density of air, of, of magnitude <coughs> of velocity. And so we can use pitot tubes to be able to measure those things. Um, the design of this location here is perhaps important because you want it to be able to give you a zero change in velocity. And so you could imagine that the local design of this is important. If you have velocity coming past here and it stagnates against this, you'll develop a pressure at this point which you'd be able to measure here. So you can imagine that this would give you an overpressure which you didn't want. You can imagine that this would give you the right pressure because it's not impinging on this at all. And you can imagine from the same things that we talked about today that going over a bump would reduce gravity and reduce pressures. Then you could imagine that the pressure you'd get here from exactly the same arguments that we had uh, for this. And so in designing these things, this is the kind of geometry I suppose you want so that the pressure you measure at atmospheric really is atmospheric. And you just measure differential pressure between these two. It doesn't matter what the absolute magnitudes are. It's just the difference between pressures of a velocity that you stagnate by killing it at this point, which is the pressure you measure here, and also just a, a pressure you measure in the, in the tube elsewhere. So, pitot tubes. Um, I don't know whether these exist or not, but you could imagine that you could have direction-finding tubes from what we've talked about. Certainly, if you have fluid impinging on this pitot tube, which has three particular ports in it, I suppose in this particular case, you'd expect to have the biggest pressures measured here and here, and a much smaller pressure measured here. 
And if you do that, you could imagine that you could physically locate which is the direction in which the air is coming. And I suppose if you could move this, you want you might want to move it relative to the wind jet until you get the maximum pressure drop at one location, and the two flanking locations should be lower ones, just because of the way. So, so you can imagine being able to to do that. Okay. So, well, I guess yeah. I guess I wasn't sure that I was going to go through it this way. So we, we've talked about a couple of things. We talked about pressure measurement. Pitot tubes is one way to measure pressure. Uh, let's talk about continuity and then come back to free jets. Continuity is just one way to be able to constrain problems. And so, for instance, if we're trying to solve a problem where we have an upstream location on a streamline and a downstream location, we can always write it in terms of Bernoulli's expression between these two locations. By convention, we can write it upstream as location one and downstream as location two. Get used to just doing that. What happens if we didn't know either of the what happens if we didn't know either of these velocities? One way to do it, if we didn't have five variables, would be merely to notice that in solving this problem, instead of thinking about it as a streamline, we could think it as a stream tube. And the stream tube is uh, bounded on the top side by a streamline. It's bounded on the bottom side by a streamline. And so by definition, since no fluid can go across a streamline, it's definition, right? The normal velocity to a stream tube has to be zero. Vn equals zero by definition. Then we can think of these as just constraining boundaries. So nothing can flow across top and bottom. And so that means that if we take the volumetric flow rate, which is a width times the area at 1 times the velocity at 1, this has to equal the width times the area at 2 times the velocity at 2. And so if we're able to write v1 as equal to, what's it going to be? It's going to be, get rid of these, it's just going to be the ratio of these, right? V1 is equal to A2 over A1. It's just the ratio of the areas. So if we wanted to, we could, for instance, substitute into here. And now our equation is written only in terms of V2. And so we've solved, yeah. Why do you get rid of the Ws? Oh, it's just because they have to be equal. It has to be a plain section. So W is the width that goes into the board, right? So this is W. <laughs> Because I'm making the problem, and I'm making it, yeah, fine. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, so all, um, yeah, not a requirement for Bernoulli, but I'm assuming it's the case. So, yeah, I, I neglected to say that was my secret. So, if, if the widths are the same, you can constrain it. And so that's one way to be able to now solve a Bernoulli equation where you have, maybe you only know four of the variables, and you need to know two of them. You can constrain one of them by being the same as velocities, upstream and downstream being constrained in some way by ratio of areas. So, a useful way to do it. And, all right, so and the final component before we do something more fun uh, is to talk about free jets. Uh, again, to be able to just uh, uh, be able to, to solve a problem. And so this is a problem of a bucket with a hole in it, often called as a free jet. Um, we make life easy by drawing a streamline. Of course, the streamline could be this as well. It could be this just as easily, or it could be this. But we've chosen one here. So upstream and downstream. And so what do we want to know about these individual components? So we need P1, we need V1, and need Z1. Well, Z1 is equal to Z1, right? So just by, if you choose a datum anywhere, so it's convenient to choose it here as anything, then it's just this height that would be this. So, which I'll call H. The velocity. Well, clearly, if we weren't uh, replenishing this with water coming in here, this water level would be drawn down. And so there is some finite velocity to that top surface.
But if you look at the questions that you'll do, you'll say a big tank. A big tank is code for the velocity of this upper surface is zero. It means that the tank is big enough that so little water is coming out of here that for all intents and purposes that this isn't moving at all. This isn't being drawn down. And so if that's the case, then this upper velocity is zero. It makes life very, very easy if that's the case. Pressure. Yeah, I heard someone mumble. AMT? No, I don't think so, right? So that's, if we're using gauge pressure as in the system, then it's, it's equal to zero. We've got the same conditions at point two. Pressure at two. Same rationale as you've used before. Fluid pressure acting against here has to be atmospheric. Fluid pressures acting at a point have to be equivalent in all directions. So if it's horizontally, just outside this tank <coughs> acting, then this is e also equal to atmospheric. Elevation, oh, we did velocity, I guess. Velocity 2, we don't know. That's our unknown. And elevation, we chose our datum, datum there. So this is 0. And so if we write Bernoulli's express expression, I don't really like it doing it this way. If we write it as P1 over gamma plus Z1 plus V1 squared over 2G is equal to P2, pressure head, plus Z2 plus V2 squared over 2G. Then we know that this is 0. We know that this is 0. We know that this is 0. We know that this is h, and we know that this is 0. And so we're just left with uh, h is equal to v2 squared over 2g. Or if we rearrange that, we want velocity. Velocity 2 is equal to 2g h squared root. Bless you. So that's a standard result. So this is, I guess, the, the calculation below, but that's basically it. And you have this maybe slightly more long-winded calculation here. It basically says that, uh, well, basically says that we're taking um, potential energy and we're converting it into kinetic energy. The velocity is zero, and we have potential by this elevation, and we're converting it into kinetic energy, v squared over 2g. And so it's a standard result for a, a free jet. If we wanted to, and I'm not sure what goes on here, yeah, I guess you can do the same thing here, is that if you wanted to keep this thing going on down here, so you have point 3, and if you re rewrote Bernoulli's equation, I guess you could write it between 2 and 3, but it's probably much easier to write it between 1 and 3. And oh, I guess... I'm going to do this as uppercase H. I think you'd find out that the magnitude of V3 is equal to 2G H plus H. You can do the math yourself, but that's the, the basic result, is that the free jet is equal to this, which is interesting. It means that it doesn't really care anything about the shape of the bucket, because after it comes out here, it's coming out as a, a stream. And it's actually the same as if I took this and I dropped it on the floor. The fluid is traveling with exactly the same speed as if you dropped a, a ball of water. It's no different than that. And so fluid mechanics, in, in many respects, is exactly the same as your physics class for solid mechanics and, and dynamics, bodies flowing around, is that the velocity it's traveling at is accelerating due to the gravity. And so it's interesting that this term here, h, which is the acceleration it comes out of here with, is kind of exactly the same as this expression here, which is the full length after it comes out of the bottom. So it's the same as taking a, a glob of fluid that's going at some velocity here and letting it free fall. It will add velocity as it goes down under gravity, and the velocity it adds is just due to the, the, the height of it. 
What does that say about, uh, what will this look like as it comes out of here? Don't worry about them. What will it look like as it comes out of there? Will it be parallel sided? Or will it taper in? Because we know that uh, V2A2 has to equal V3A3. Since V3 is bigger than V2, then A3 has to be less than A2. Right? And you can calculate that. Yep? Uh, that's very inviscid, right? It's inviscid, yes. Yeah, what, what, what do you think would happen to the speed? I think it's opposite, it's going down. Let's go down, yeah, right, yeah. And so we can calculate what that is, and we will do. And it's going to be a function of viscosity, right? You can imagine. It would be linearly, a linear function of viscosity. So, so we, yeah. All in due course, we'll get there. So, blah, 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 blah. We can talk about these. That's not, well, we're not done for today. Well, we can be done for today if you want, but I guess that's not. Let's mess around with the, the jet lev, just, just because we can. What happened to uh, my browser? Okay. Uh, Jetlev. So let's mess around with this just because it's interesting to, to look at. So we could do the same kinds of things with uh, the Jetlev, right? So the questions that we mentioned before that we might want to be able to calculate are that uh, if you're designing this, for instance, how fast a jet of water do you have to have so it'll, it'll keep someone up off the, off the water, uh, and what kind of power in this umbilical uh, pump, which is towed behind here, you can see there just behind this guy, uh, do you need to be able to do that? And so that, those might be a couple of questions that uh, you could you'd ask yourself. So let's see if we can answer that, just because we, I don't want it playing in the background. Okay. So. Here we go. Where are we? Oh, I think that's my best writing ever. So, um, what do we want? So I suppose we could draw um, all kinds of uh, things. So we could have two. These are our locations. Obviously, we have a jet coming down here at some velocity. So this is uh, this has some weight attached to it, right? 100 kilograms maybe, someone attached to it. There's a weight of a, a column of water as well. And I suppose we could do some things with that to write uh, pressure over unit weight plus elevation plus V squared over 2G. And we could write what each of these terms are as we go down through here. At location one, um, so we're inside it. Actually, it's not very convenient to, to write it. So we know, I suppose, that the velocity 1 would be high. Don't really know what it is. We don't really know what the pressure 1 would be. I guess it would be high as well if we're, if we're squeezing fluid out. Um, and we'd certainly, we would know what the elevation is. But, so that's not, not very useful to us. We could write uh, the expression at point two. Pressure at two, what would that be? Could make a pretty good argument that it's outside the jet. Fluid pressure, atmospheric, is acting perpendicular to it. And so the fluid pressure, therefore, has to be zero. We also know the elevation. And we know that the velocity at two would be some number, which would be is big. But I think that the two 
that we'd like to be able to work with would be the location 3 and 4, because clearly there's a big transformation at 3 and 4. At location 3, what would be the pressure? I hear it. We know the elevation. Well, let's say that the elevation is 0. Let's say that locations 3 and 4 aren't very far from each other. So in other words, Z3 equals Z4, basically. And so it equals 0. And at location 3, there's a velocity, which we don't know. And then all of a sudden, at location 4, it hits the water. By definition, it's a stagnation point. And so pressure 4, don't know. Elevation is 0. But we do know what V4 is. It's got to equal 0. And so if we write Bernoulli out for all of these, for the most convenient locations, P1 over gamma plus Z1 plus V1 squared over 2G is equal to, we know that actually we're only going to have a, a few terms left, right? Z2, well, let me, okay, I'll go back and I won't write them as 1s and 2s, I'll write them as what they should be. We're going to write it from 3, I guess this is 3, make this 3, make this 3, make this 4, 2 goes to 4 quite easily. And what do we know? So we said that P3 is atmospheric, so this is 0. We said that Z3 and Z4 are the same, so we get rid of those. We said that V3 is we don't know. We said that V4 is stagnation, so this is 0. And we don't know this. So we basically have that V3 squared over 2G is equal to the pressure at 4. Uh, maybe it's easier to write out unit weight in terms of density and gravity because we know that we can get rid of this. And so we have something like P4 is equal to rho V3 squared. I guess there's a 2 in there as well, right? So if we know what P three is, we could calculate what the velocity would have to be. And we have some inkling, right, of what P3 is. So we know that if there's this jet of fluid is coming down and it has some cross-sectional area, which is this here, stop it, we know that P has to equal a force that has to be able to eat this. So the force acting upwards has to be equal to the weight acting downwards. So the weight has to be what? has to be equal to uh, the mass of a person times g. meters per second squared, which is about uh, 1,000 newtons. And the force has to equal pressure times area. We know that this is pressure here. Area is what? Choose a nice, easy area. Four inches in diameter. Let's not think of it as a circle. Let's think of it as a square. Four inches is 10 centimeters. 10 centimeters is 0.1 of a meter. And so if area is 0 0.1, Point one squared and pressure is equal to rho v squared over 2 then I guess we can rearrange this as what? I want to get velocity is equal to 2 over density of water uh, you're going to have to correct me if I go wrong. 
divided by area and multiplied by mass times gravity. And this is, hopefully that's right. If we throw some numbers in there, this is two, it's a thousand kilograms per meter cubed, uh, one over 0 0.1 squared, mass is 100 kilograms, multiplied by g is 1,000 newtons, uh, which is equal, that's convenient, and 0 0.1 squared is, uh, is that right? Ten to the minus two. So it seems like a very small number. Have I done something wrong? Yeah, and squared it. Yeah, but still a very small number. So this is one point four times ten to the minus one. Is zero point one four. Um, new. So, sorry? Is it 14.2? Yeah. Well, I'll take that. That sounds about right. And this is 14.2, uh, it's velocity meters per second, right? Is that right? 14.2? Oh, yeah, of course, yes, yes, yes. Silly me. So that's about right. So that's uh, the velocity that you need to have water coming out of it. And so what is that? Uh, that's of the order of uh, about 30 miles an hour. Seems reasonable. Seems right, right order of magnitude. What about the power that you have to apply to it? So what? Work is equal to force times displacement. Power equals rate of doing work. Which is equal to force times velocity. And so if you think about it, the work that this thing is doing is it's traveling down at some velocity. It applies a force due to this. And therefore, the product of those two has to equal the amount of uh, work that's done per unit time. Work per unit time, by definition, is power. And so what do we say our force was? Our force was 1,000 newtons. <coughs> You said our velocity was, I guess it's 14. Actually, I, even I can multiply 14 by 1,000, so I guess we can do this. Kilo newtons meters per second, which is, this is a joule. Joules per second is uh, watts, right? So this is 14 watts, 14 kilowatts. So, so simply we've calculated, we've sized the, the, the plant that you need to be able to do this just by very, very simple calculation, just by making some pretty straightforward assumptions which seem to be borne out in, um, in the, the, the videos we looked at. Looks like the jet coming out is some. There's two of them, I suppose. So we've only chosen one jet just to make life easy for ourselves. Uh, but but just by making some very simple assumptions, uh, we've come up with this. And I think a kilowatt is about equal to horsepower, right? So 1.3. So this is about 14 horsepower. Actually, it's about 20 horsepower. I think one kilowatt. I looked it up. I, that's the only reason I know it is 1.3 horsepower. I said we wouldn't use those nasty units. Um, so this is about 20 horsepower. So 20 horses. 
20 of those green cars that get blown down. I guess it's, that's a two horsepower car. The two, de chevaux is two horsepower. So that's it. So it allows you to be able to calculate some, some things. Uh, where is it? So, so from looking at what we have here, really being able to conceptualize a problem, being able to figure out exactly what the important things are, being able to figure out exactly where we want to be able to calculate our behavior. And I guess in this case, all we do is we calculate the velocity of the water just before it hits the static water, where we should have zero pressure and have some big velocity. And then immediately after it hits the water, when it should have some zero velocity and some larger pressure because it's supporting the column that's above it. We could get very complicated by including both the weight of the person sitting on top of this column and the weight of the water column itself, uh, but we don't really need to do that. So we've got a, a rough idea of what's going on. The other thing that we've historically messed around with, I guess, has been to look at, uh, I guess we don't have a video of this, but this is uh, the world land, spree, land speed record. And I guess you can see this is his uh, backside here. This is his face here, his heels. I guess there's a crank here. And so this is the, uh, the world prone um, uh, speed, bicycle uh, speed. And so I guess the record is almost 100 kilometers an hour. And you could do the same things uh, with that. You could calculate the uh, amount of human energy that you needed to apply that by exactly the same calculation, right? So the calculation would be something like um, you have a bicycle, you're pushing it through the wind, you put the area here. We write Bernoulli in terms of a pressure, a unit weight is equal to a velocity squared over 2g. So this is the pressure at location 2, the velocity at location 1. And of course, instead of assuming that the bicycle's moving through the air, because of our conceptualization of it having to be steady state, it's much easier to think of the bicycle static and the air moving past it. So the velocity v1 is some magnitude here, and the pressure p2 is impinging on the face of the front of this bicycle. This is just the bicycle. And we can do the same thing again. We can calculate, if we wanted to calculate the power that this person would have to expend to do that, we could write that uh, pressure times area is equal to a force. And so we could merely write this, what do we need to know? I guess we multiply both sides by area, multiply both sides by unit weight. And so this now is force is equal to V1 squared over 2G <coughs> times area times rho G. Bang, bang, which is V1 squared times area times density over 2. And so the force is going to be equal to, we said the velocity was 100 kilometers an hour, so 10 to the 2 squared. Yeah. Oh, yeah, OK, no, that's OK, that's an hour. So I guess we need it in terms of meters per second, do we have it? Yeah, so 50, what do we say, 56 miles an hour Mile an hour is roughly double meters per second, so it's about 30 meters per second. So, so let's scrap this. Sorry. Uh, 30 meters per second squared times area, one meter for sure, right? Density, one kilogram per meter cubed. Don't really care about two so much. And so this is equal to the force, which we have to apply. 30 squared threes are, are 9. That's 900. That's 10 to the 3, right? 10 to 3 over 2 newtons. Newtons. So it's about 500 newtons. And power is equal to force 
times velocity, which is equal to 500 newtons. Uh, and the velocity was thir times 30. 3 fives are 15, so that's 1,500, 15,000. Newton meters per second. Fifteen kilowatts.